John chapter 21, please. John chapter 21, obviously, as many of you probably know, is the last chapter of the Gospel of John. Other than that 10-month break that we had when I was uh, traveling the world and, uh, you know, doing this Great Commission Ministries missions organization, um, we had spent well over a year in the Gospel of John every Sunday morning. And honestly, I'm not refreshed that it's over. It has been so transforming for me personally, and I know for many of you, to really have dug deep into this gospel, a very unique gospel amongst the four gospels. It has been a glorious transformation, and I thank God for all that he has done through our church in the power of his word going forth. Um, this chapter is the epilogue. It's kind of a unique thing. The Bible never follows worldly traditions or any type of um, norms that we would consider. Uh, it could have ended in verse 31 on chapter 20 because verse 31 is really the very purpose statement of the gospel of John, of 30 and 31. And uh, that purpose statement has a perfect ending, and yet we are so blessed over the next two weeks, both this Sunday and next Sunday, we will cover the chapter 21 and receive so much from it, it is truly a treasure hidden at the ending, the conclusion of this gospel. We ended in verse 31, two Sunday, Sundays ago, it says, These things are written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, and that in believing you may have the Son of God, and you may believing that you may have life in his name. This is written, this book, for that reason. And Though, of course, it is talking about our belief in who Jesus Christ is and what he's done is a gateway, if you will, a doorway into salvation itself. John 14, 6, the Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes into the Father except through me. We must know Jesus Christ and his salvation, his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection in order to be born again. But the life that is spoken of here in verse 31 is not just talking about because of salvation we have a destination, but rather and more profoundly because of the salvation we have in Christ, we have a quality of life that we have entered into through a relationship with Jesus Christ. A quality of life is spoken of here. John 10 mentions it. Jesus Christ says, I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly that we may abound not just after we die and perfection with him in heaven, a perfected, complete perfection relationship with him, but it's talking about a quality of life here on earth, a life that is filled with the hope of Jesus Christ the hope of his promises, knowing that we will be with him, knowing that we have a hope in heaven, the joy that we have, the peace that we have in Christ is the abundant life. Everything about that life is abundant here on earth. Yeah, it, it doesn't mean we don't go through trials. In fact, the Christian life can oftentimes be much more difficult in some regards than living in the world and being of the world. But nevertheless, the world can never have without Christ what we experience in our hearts that manifests itself out into our lives and in ministry to other people. And that is the joy that we have in knowing Him and having a relationship with Him. I remember before I was saved, the life that I had. My 
My sin was just selfishness and pride that manifested into a party life. I would have been that guy at Club TMT because I was that guy before I got saved. Partying, wasting my life away, entertaining and for a, a fleeting moment enjoying the pleasures of sin. As the Bible says, sin can be pleasurable for a season, but it is a short season. It's fleeting. It's but a vapor. But with that life comes anxieties. Many of you know, even if you weren't a partier, you know what I'm talking about. The anxieties you experience without Christ. The paranoia. The depression. All of these things that go on. And when Christ comes in, and as we abide in Him, they are pushed out and we feel this overwhelming sense of peace, a peace that is so profound and so heavenly that it surpasses even our mental understanding. And that peace that we enjoy, and I hope you can say this along with me, metaphorically, is that we, we wouldn't trade it for all the money in the world. I'm telling you, I was so filled with stress, anxiety, paranoia. You know, the, the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as lion. I was, I was literally fleeing down the road thinking cops were behind me. They weren't. I had such paranoia over police that, you know, it took a miracle to get rid of that when I was in America But then it came back when I came to Kenya because of all the bribes that they asked for. Now I'm still paranoid when I see a cop when I'm driving down the road. There's there's some good ones. I'm sure there's a couple here now. I wouldn't trade it for all the money in the world. The quality of life is what Jesus is speaking for. It's in knowing him is the abundant life. Now in verse 1, the Bible says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples and at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, as called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. There are a couple different beliefs in what is happening here. I'll give you both of them. Um, And one of the beliefs is that these men... Simon Peter is backslidden, that he um, was instructed, as we actually read in the last couple weeks in John's gospel, to go and preach forgiveness. Um, There's a great commissioning in every one of the gospels. In Matthew 28, it says, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. In Luke's gospel, the Great Commission is go preach repentance and forgiveness. In John's gospel, it was a little more unique and in some ways more complicated, which we went through that. I don't want to explain it again, but nevertheless, it was given to the disciples, Jesus told them, he said, hey, to whom you forgive the sins, those sins are forgiven. And to whom those, the sins you do not forgive, those sins are retained, or the sins that are retained are retained. And we explained that, but simply it's go preach forgiveness, and you have 100% assurity that if somebody receives Jesus Christ, believes in him, believes on him, believes in the cross, that their sins are washed away. They're forgiven. And also, as 100%, you can be assured that when you preach forgiveness because of the gospel and the cross, 
that their sins are forgiven, you can also preach 100% assured that those sins of the people, those people who reject Jesus Christ, who rebel against Jesus Christ, you can confidently 100% tell them their sins are not forgiven and they will spend eternity, eternity separated from God. So we have confidence in both, but the point is that they got the Great Commission and some believe that Peter wanting to go fishing is him backsliding and not going into the direction that God wanted him to to preach forgiveness. Now, whether that's true or not, it's not something I particularly think is true. I think Peter's being practical in Matthew 28. Uh, Jesus tells Peter uh, and the disciples to go wait in this Galilee region. Wait for him. And I think while they're waiting, they just go fishing. But nevertheless, the opposite view has a lot of good preaching points. Preaching points that are true, that if we are backslidden, we are not going to have fruit in our lives as when they fished that night, casting the net on the left side, they caught nothing. Nothing. The other, there, there's many points that preachers will make in preaching this text of Scripture. Also, that Peter did not keep his backsliding to himself, but rather announced to others what he's doing so that others could come along with him in his backslidden state. And the principle does apply. That when you are backslidden, people know it. And people will be stumbled by it. Even more now than ever before, people know what you are doing. Did you know that? Facebook. Facebook. I mean, people are announcing in the morning when they wake up. We don't care. They're announcing what they're having for breakfast. And they take pictures of it. Uh, you know, it's a sparkling glass of passion juice. Good for you. To me, personally, I believe it's odd. Now, I think Facebook can be used for the glory of God. But I also think, more than not, it is used for the glory of man. Which is not very glorious in comparison to the glory of Christ. And we have created in our technological world a system where we can socially know everybody's business. Boy, I wish I lived in a different time at times where people didn't always know my business. You know, one of the greatest traits of humility is to mind your own business. It is the divisive person at times, the busybody who must know everybody's business. But now more than ever, but uh, now more than ever, people know what you're doing. And when you announce to the world all that you're doing in your backsliding state, there will be those who come along with you as these guys came along with the Apostle Peter. Now, the Apostle Peter and these guys are going back to what Jesus called them from when he commissioned them to follow him. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And these men are now like, well, Jesus has visited us a few times, but now he's gone. We're going to wait for him and let's go catch some fish. They're unsuccessful at it. They caught nothing. Jesus said to them while on the shore, verse 5, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast thy net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put out his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea, but the other disciples came in the little boat, 
For they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So Jesus is very reminiscent of what happened in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, they're out fishing. He calls out to them, hey, guys, been fishing all night. Why don't you cast your net in again? They cast it in, and they brought so much fish up in Luke chapter 5 that the nets actually broke. But in this case, the nets do not break. After the cross, the burial, and the resurrection, our nets will not break in our lives. We will sustain and be sustained by the power of Jesus Christ. There's some symbology here. Now, whether or not they were backslidden or they were just being practical and waiting for Jesus Christ, the fact remains that they did not catch any fish the entire night. These are professional fishermen. Professional fishermen catching nothing. Maybe they're rusty, maybe not. But he says, cast onto the right side. And many people look way too much into this. What does the right side mean? We're not going to do that, but simply just to say that divine guidance will produce fruit and a harvest, and non divine, not being divinely guided, will produce, and this is important, nothing. If the Lord doesn't build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. It is completely vanity, complete vanity to do something without the power of the Holy Spirit walking in the will of God. So if they're backslidden, they catch nothing. But as soon as they're divinely guided, they're caught so much that they can't even contain the nets. I have seen so many people go plant churches. And they come up with their ideas on how to get a crowd. They come up with their ideas on how to catch the big fish. As it says here, they caught big fish. But our idea of big fish is a different idea of the Bible's calling it big fish. To a, so many ministers, unfortunately, and not all of them, the big fish is those who have money that can donate to their church large sums. Those are the big fish. James talks about this. He says, don't treat people with a lot of money differently than you treat people with little money. Don't say to that rich person, come in, And sit in the high seat, the padded chairs, while the poor people get to sit in the plastic chairs, in the low seat on the floor. Treat people the same. I've seen so many even well-intentioned ministers go out to plant churches and they speak on what they perceive are the topics of the day. They speak on what people are most interested in, in their carnality, rather than what the people need, which is the Word of God. They'll talk about, you know, all right, 18 weeks of a fruitful marriage. I'm not saying that's bad, and some fruit may come from it, but I can tell you this, there's nothing like the power of going through God's Word. There's nothing like it. Being divinely guided, and we have been divinely guided through Scripture to cover the whole counsel of God. Calvary Chapel Eldoret and many Calvary chapels around the world are fruitful, and let me just speak of our church, not because of a man, not because of me. If you know me, which many of you know me personally, you know how imperfect I am. What kind of failures I have. And you'll know, man, boy, the Lord really did a work through him. I don't know how he can possibly do that. 
And let me tell you how. The Word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts right to the heart of man, right into the most inner being of somebody. There's no substitute for the power of God. Not the charismatic behavior of an individual, not the education of individual. There's no substitute for the power of God's word. There's no substitute for being divinely guided. Now, for those who aren't walking in the will of God, obeying his word and being empowered by the Holy Spirit, please listen, empowered by the Holy Spirit, it does not only produce some fruit, it produces no fruit. They caught nothing the whole night. There was a gentleman in the state of Illinois in America. He went through a university that was very questionable and wrong called Robert Schuller University. Some of you may know it. He was a universalist, though he posed as a Christian minister. And Many people went through his school, very famous school in California. And um, one of those gentlemen was the name of Bill Hybels. Bill Hybels kind of learned how to attract crowds. You organize your church this way. You speak on these topics. You don't speak on these topics, which a lot of those topics that you don't speak on were biblical topics. And after 30 years of ministry, he had a church that was over 25,000 people. And I mention his name only to say this. He said this. Bill Heibel said that all the church growth programs in the world, if not grounded in the Holy Scriptures, may produce large crowds like our church, but that does not produce holiness in the people. Those were his words. He noticed that his church had breed, breeded many people that were worldly. Now, there's always sin in people in even good churches. But he was talking about my church is filled with people who don't even believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There is no fruit unless we are walking in the power of the Holy Spirit obeying the will of God. Now Jesus, he doesn't yell out, guys. He doesn't yell out, hey, you bunch of backsliding cowards. I'm tired of you. You're out fishing. I called you away from the fish three and a half years ago. I told you to go preach forgiveness. You get over here so I can yell at you some more. That's not what he does. That's not what Jesus does. That's not how he treats us. Aren't you glad? I'm so glad for it. Isaac Newton may be the greatest genius who's ever walked the face of the earth. Said on his deathbed, one of the great things I've realized in my life is I am a great sinner, but Christ is even a greater savior. No, he's compassionate. He's like, hey, guys, you caught anything? Here we go. Another guy thinking he knows things. Cast on the right side. And they do it. And they catch so much fish. But this time, the nets do not break. And they recognize this. They recognize who it is. But guess what? We're going to learn next week, even what we may read this week. They can't recognize him physically very well. When they look at him, they're like, listen, we're not going to ask him if he's the Lord. We, we, we see that in this chapter, and the reason for that is his glorified body looks much different than his body looked while he walked with these men the three and a half years. He looks different. They can't recognize him. Though in a previous visit, he did show them their scars his scars in his hands and in his side. In this visit, they're probably covered up by clothing. They're like, you know what? We may, we may not be able to recognize him physically. There is a resemblance, but we know for sure his voice. 
we know for sure this is the kind of thing that God does. Let me ask you this question, church. Those of you who are born again, you know when God is speaking through people or you. Have you ever been hanging out with one of your friends or a family member and you guys start encouraging one another? You start preaching the things of God or sharing the things of God, His Word and, and truth and all this. It's not just the Illuminati all the time. You know, you know that Calvary Chapel, <laughs> they, they kill people there and bury them under the stage. It's like, really? Oh, you know what's going on with this COVID? Illuminati. I know there's some sinister things going on. I'd rather focus on the word at times. I know I talk about it too. Is anybody ever talk, tired of talking about the government? Anybody ever get tired of it? Especially you women. Guys talk about this stuff more than women. You ever notice this? Guys will sit down. Hey, you know what's going on? <laughs> well, let me tell you. Russia, you know. Listen, there are some things going on. You know, Russia is prophesied in Ezekiel 38. We can talk about that. But sometimes I just get weary talking about how corrupt the government. The, corrupts, the government has been corrupt since the beginning of governments. It's just, they're just nasty. They get power and absolute power corrupts absolutely and things happen. But I know a God who's going to set them straight. And I ain't got to worry about it. You know what I want to do? I want to make sure you hear the word of God. Have you ever had that moment with your friend where somebody says this? That was God. You didn't say that. God is speaking through you. You ever had that moment? Oh, that was God. I think we need to bring that kind of language back more. Because the Holy Spirit lives in us, church. And we need to speak forth the things of God to where other spiritual people are like, man, God's speaking through you. Thank you for that. I remember one time I was with a friend in a truck, first two years of my salvation in this program. We were doing lawn crew, doing cutting grass. It was just me and him. We started talking on the things of God. I'll never forget the Holy Spirit just fell down in that truck, just upon us so powerfully that it got quiet. <laughs> we're like, and we both looked at each other. It's like, do you, do you sense that? I was like, yeah, oh, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. When you start speaking the things of God, you are speaking on behalf of Christ and spiritual people will know the voice of Christ. Christ is trying to get us to speak on his behalf. So John, who's, John is just one of those spiritual guys amongst the group, you know? He's just one of those guys. He's young, which is... A good sign, God often uses the younger people because younger people are so looked down upon in society all the time, in every society that's ever lived, even in America. But I got to tell you, in Kenya, I had no idea how you, bad young people were looked down on in terms of their capabilities and qualifications until I started a church when I was 23 years old in Eldoret. People started loving the church. They're like, hey, I love the church. I love it but I can't go. They're like, why? Because people are telling me I'm going to the kids' church. It's like, am I the kid? I'm like, yeah. Like, oh, I'm so hurt. <laughs> they don't like me. It's okay. Jesus likes me. I don't, John's just one of those guys. He says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter's like, oh, it is. This is just the thing he would do. That's just the thing he would say. And Peter grabs his outer garment. Don't you love this guy? He's such an extremist. I, I wish I could relate with John and, and, and Paul more, but I, I, I got to tell you, I relate with Peter so much. He is such a moron. And, and I'm happy for that because I am as well. I, I mean that. I'm not trying to just be relatable. I have done so many dumb things. I have said so many stupid things. It's just amazing. My, my, uh, my brother David is, you know, he's come with me. He, I, I mentioned him a few times, he shared his testimony. I don't think he would mind me saying this. He is one of the biggest imbeciles I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and I'm saying that because he told me that this morning. <laughs> 
He goes, man, he goes, dude, I got to ask for forgiveness. You know the Lord's working in him. He goes, I got to ask forgiveness. I say the stupidest things. Sorry. I'm like, yeah, you too. You're a moron. We're brothers, so we can, we can joke around. I see myself in Peter so much, just extreme in every way. Jesus is saying, hey, many of you are going to be offended by me. You're going to leave me. He prophesies. Peter stands up. I will not leave you. Even if all these other wusses, all these other cowards leave you, I will not. I will die for you. I mean, it's just something I would say. And we're going to see next week that Peter's heart has changed in a beautiful way. He's now beginning to doubt himself and trust Jesus. Church, it is a glorious day when somebody doubts their abilities and begins to trust in the strength of Christ. It is one of the most beautiful things we can ever witness and it is one of the most glorious things we can ever experience. But Peter jumps off the boat. He, begins, he can't wait. As much as he's an extreme in doing what's wrong, he's an extreme in pursuing Jesus Christ. I'm not going to wait for us to row this boat. I can swim faster than that boat, and I'm going to get to my Lord and Savior. And we need to have the same attitude, church. We're willing to jump into the sea in order to get to Jesus, even if we don't have a boat provided for us to get us there. And by the way, most scholars believe that's actually Peter's boat that he abandoned in jumping in the sea. We need to be willing to abandon our boats, our homes, if Jesus is calling us to come towards him. And he comes. It's the Lord. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter went up, and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples asked him, who are you knowing that it was the Lord? You know, Peter See, the reason why this is such a unique epilogue, a unique conclusion, is it goes from this glorious epitaph, this glorious climax to saying, this is the purpose of the gospel of John. And then it goes on another chapter, primarily discussing the apostle Peter and what's going on with him. Why? And it's not just the Apostle Peter. It mentions some other disciples, as we'll talk about in a moment. But, but why? Because we can relate with Peter so much. He represents not just humanity. He represents those who are trying to follow Jesus. And, and Peter... Are they saying anything good? If it's a politician, don't vote for him. He's interrupting to God's word. Um, So so he goes to the shore after those, it took all those guys to bring, and Peter drags 153 fish alone up to the barbecue. This is one of the reasons why many scholars believe Peter is this charismatic, big, tall, strong working man. The the weight would have been about three, four hundred pounds. Guys, we would have been very impressed with Peter. He grabs the nets, he's like, get away, get away. He's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Impressive. And yet, what the world is impressed by, the kingdom of God is not. It's not. 
The world is impressed with tall, handsome, good-looking, strong men. We often think, boy, that guy, we could use him in the kingdom. Boy, if he was on stage preaching, he would really captivate people's attention. Uh, Listen, I believe we should be physically good stewards of our bodies. But at the same time, it's of little regard to the Lord in terms of our usefulness in his kingdom. He wants people by faith following him. Now, a lot of people make a big deal of 153, the number. I'm not going to do that today. But there is something very special here. And that is that when Jesus fed the 5,000 men, you guys remember that story? John chapter 6, which 5,000 men, where women are, you know, or men, you know there are women. We praise God for that, right, men? We like women around. We like our wives around. And where women and men are, we know there are children. So there may have been up to 10 to 12,000, they say, people in this uh, uh, feeding of the 5,000. Yeah, thank you. If, the, if this is the club playing this music, um, get the big, tall, strong guys to go shut them down. So they're there. And, and, and do you remember what Jesus The dialogue that he has with his disciples. The disciples come to Jesus and say, Jesus, all these people are going to faint. They're going to pass out along the way if they don't eat. And since we don't have the food to feed, 10,000 people send them home. Do you remember what Jesus said to them before he feeds them? He says, hey guys, you feed them. You feed them, and they complain about not having enough food. Do you think Jesus doesn't know that they don't have enough food physically to feed 10,000 people? He's God. Of course he knows that they don't have enough feed, food to feed uh, 10,000 people. I mean, do you ever find it interesting how much these disciples inform Jesus Christ about what's going on? That shows a lack of faith and a lack of belief in their master whom they're following. Hey, Jesus, you're probably not aware since you don't pay attention to the small things like my life and my school fees and my career. Was that too mocking? I'm sorry. Forgive me. No, I'm not sorry. Take that back. They're informing him. In the same way, when Jesus preached a controversial message, do you remember when he he rebukes the Pharisees and the disciples come up to Jesus? They're like, Jesus, do you know? I don't know why. I I picture them putting their hands on their side. Some pompous look. Jesus, do you know they were offended with you? If your preaching doesn't offend somebody, you ain't preaching right. Now, I'm not saying be offensive for offensive sake. We need to be kind and loving. But nevertheless, in our loving kindness, we need to preach the truth. And the world hates the truth. Oh, good. They're gone. And and so, Jesus... What is he doing? He's telling them, I want you to feed them and I want you to have the faith enough to start passing out food without any further instructions. Man, wouldn't that have been glorious if they're like, hey, he told us to feed him. We don't have the food, but he knows that. Let's pass it out. And guess what? I believe with all of my heart the same results would have happened that they would have fed 10,000 people. So you got Jesus here on the shore with these disciples. He's, he's got some food already. He's not just, it's not just blind faith. It is evidential faith. He's got some fish. He's got some bread. Not enough to feed all the disciples. In the same way, it wasn't enough to feed 
all of the 10,000. And Jesus said, hey, you guys got some extra food, bring it. How did they catch the extra food? Divine guidance, casting on the right side of the boat, listening to the word of God. They're starting to learn to walk by faith in Jesus Christ so that they can participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ. You see it? Oh, Lord, I don't know how. I'm going to survive doing what I know is right. But I believe by faith, when I walk in your will, you will provide a harvest. When I was moving to um, Kenya, me and my wife, years ago, it was a mixture of two things, faith and foolishness. Because I was young. I, back then I thought it was just faith. I, I realize now it was an impulsive act of a young man wanting to see a good church in Eldoret, Kenya. But you know what? The Lord can use the faith of a young, immature man and move mountains with it. He can. For all things work to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I think back and I'm like, nowadays I'm 36 years old. The thought of starting another church, which I may have to do one day, is horrifying to me. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, it is not easy. It, it, it is, not only do I have to deal with you, even worse, I have to deal with me through the whole process. And it's rough, and it takes a lot of time and energy. But do you know how you spell the word love? Does anybody know how to spell the word love in here? It's spelled T-I-M-E, time. Giving your time is a big indication of who and what you love. And so... He's calling us to faith. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm not going to put my kids in that institution that teaches homosexuality or atheism. I don't know how it's going to work, but I am convicted to be a part of the assembling together and I will not work seven days a week and miss every church service. I know there's some personal conviction there. I don't know how it's going to work. But I'm going to reject this position in order to follow the will of God for my life. I'm, I'm not being, I don't want you to be dogmatic. You take that personally and do with it what you will. But Jesus says to them, guys, bring your food too. Because through divine guidance, you got some more food because you had the faith to cast your nets. Think about what is the Lord calling you to step out in faith? What is, he, what is it? I don't know. I can only relate to you things I've gone through. Does he want you to do a different career choice? You know university is an idol in our world? I'm not saying university is evil. It's wonderful if you've got the means to do it. But it's such an idol that parents are pressured into it so deeply that they feel like they're bad parents if they don't get their kids in university. Listen, parents, if you don't have the means to put your 18 children through university, you still can be a great parent. Woo, we got two amens. Woo, we're working here. We're working. The Lord's moving. Bring your fish. Bring your fish. Cook with me. Come and eat breakfast. There's probably a state of confusion still. They're probably still battling. And by the way, it's, it's an endless battle. We, we can't have victory over shame and condemnation. But at this point, they're probably still, with shame, still dealing with shame and condemnation. They betrayed Jesus. They were scattered. 
They were locked up in an upper room hiding from the world instead of going into the world. And Jesus continues to demonstrate his grace and mercy. Come and eat breakfast with me. Has any of you ever blown away by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ? He's the one cooking. How amazing is that? Listen, guys, Peter, you're such a character. You just dragged 400 pounds, jumped into the water. I, I personally, by the way, I love laughter. You guys probably know that. I, 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 laughter is good. I, I'm always worried about the person who says they're a Christian and walks around life like this. I just, I, I, I'm not kidding. One of my goals in life is try to make them laugh. I, though it's a mixture of stupidity and, and self-acknowledgement and ambition on these disciples, I believe at times Jesus just laughed. I think he was laughing when, when Peter jumped into the water. Oh, Peter. Oh, I'm going to use you. You're, you're so little. You're so little. And he started to see himself little, which is a good thing. Then he goes and drags. He's like, hey, guys, bring the fish. Peter's like, I got it. He is such a nerd for Jesus Christ. I got it, guys, hiking up his robe, dragging the 400 pounds. Here you go. Just laughing. He's not yelling at them. He's gracious towards them. Listen, guys. I wanted to go back It says the last verse that this is the third time Jesus visited after he rose again. But I want to go back. It mentions the disciples in the first part of the chapter. Simon Peter's there, Thomas, Nathaniel. And then it says, and two others. And two others. Why does it say that? Well, the Holy Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit coming upon holy men to write the holy book does not write things coincidentally. I'll just throw that in there for no reason. I believe that is there for a reason. And this is the reason why I believe it's there. The two disciples are me and you. Me and you. And we get confused and we get distracted, and we go back to things possibly that they're not sin, but things we shouldn't be back involved in. And Jesus is calling us, church, to come hang out with him. Put away the boat. Put it all away. Come, to, come spend time with me. This is a visitation from the Lord. And they're going to have a meal together. I believe that's what the Lord would have for you and me today as well. Come. Spend time with Christ. Have a meal with Him. You have many meals in this book. Turn the cell phone off for a moment. Put it in a drawer for a few hours. Get off of Facebook. Turn off the radio. Turn off the television. Moms, give your kids some medicine so they sleep a few hours. That's a joke. Don't do that. Moms, tell your husbands to watch the kids for a few hours. Husbands, get away. Get alone with Christ. He's calling to you. Put it all down. Ladies, don't you get offended when you go on a date with your guy and he has, he's on the phone the whole time? Or guys, don't you get offended when your girl's on the phone the whole time? It's just showing that we're not very interested in each other. And even if we're that busy, we need to take time. It's offensive. It's offensive. Jesus is calling out to his disciples saying, come, spend some time with me. Hang out with me. Be with me. Have a meal with me. I'll feed you. I'll feed you. 
I have food. Isn't it amazing when you, when you do that, when you get alone with him, how he has the supernatural ability to minister to you a meal every time? He's calling out church. He's calling out to come away from the busyness of the sea, of the ocean of distraction, and come to him and sit down so that you can receive direction, you can receive encouragement because he is not yelling at you. You can receive grace, you can receive a meal, you can receive instruction as we'll see next week. If this is not one of the habits of your life, make it one of the habits and receive the amazing joy of hanging out with Jesus Christ. Let's pray as the worship team comes forward. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the direction. We thank you for the mercy continually displayed through the words that you speak to your disciples as we have learned these many weeks. What patience would wait as we constantly roam what Father so tender is calling us home. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your word. I pray for each and every person sitting in this room right now that you would give them a meal beyond what they received this morning. That when they leave this place today, you would encourage them, even if they're confused or filled with stress, and worry that your voice would come to them, that tender voice that we love so much, ministering that meal to them, that you would bless them. I pray for that. Lord, we pray over the offering as we continue to worship you. Those of us who've purposed in our heart, would you receive it? In obedience to your word and giving on the first day of the week, as the New Testament tells us, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand as the ushers and deacons come forward and we sing this song?